Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Right or Die show. I'm your host, Brandi Lee Bosla. On today's episode, I am talking to Mary Elizabeth Jackson again, <laughs> but we are talking about being parents of kids with neurodiversities. So we've got a whole different conversation for you all lined up. If you didn't see the episode with Mary that she's already been on, that is episode 67, hashtag Lifebox. So go ahead and check that out as well. But don't worry, you don't have to listen to that one before you watch this one. Welcome back. Long time no talk. (laughs) Yes, right. Do you like my cup? Look. Ah, Star Trek. Yeah, I'm not a Star Trek person, but I know there's lots of people that are. So don't unsubscribe to the channel just because I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) Are you a Star Wars fan? Uh, not really, no. Okay, so some people are more Star Trekky, some more more Star Wars, but I grew I'm up more with like Freddy Krueger. Oh, all right. So you were just on the show not that long ago. It was episode sixty-seven for those of you who have not watched it yet, and it's actually really funny because um, Mary's episode was just posted, and we're doing the recording for the follow-up the same day. I know, isn't that funny? <laughs> And it wasn't planned that way, like at all. No. Um, no, she had no idea when she booked her second one to that uh, it would be posted this day. So it's just uh, that's right. Her. So I, I, what I do, I emailed you today. Are we still? Are we still nope. on today? Yeah. <laughs> it was so funny. Yeah. So we wanted to follow up because we realized as we were doing that first interview that we have a lot of commonalities when it comes to parenting and the world of neurodiversity. Absolutely. Yes. And it is an interesting world. It is a ever changing, constantly on your toes, make you grow, never get to sit down and relax world. (laughs) Exactly. Is that a good explanation or description of it? I love it. It works for me. Um, (laughs) Oh, and I've been using, I've been using life box. I have been using (gasps) life box. Notice that was the, that's the title of Mary's episode. Hashtag life box. Yes, absolutely. I've been using that when I've been talking and when I've been like in front of people and doing events or whatever and talking about kids and let's give them tools for their life box. Uh Like in our toolbox, we need a wrench, we need a screwdriver, we need a hammer. So our life box requires lots of different tools as well. So yes. So when did you join the world of neurodiversity? (laughs) Mm, After my, well, you know what? That's interesting. So my, my first daughter at 18 months was diagnosed with texture sensitivity, but back then the, the, I said, well, what do I do about this? The doctor says nothing. You don't do anything. You just feed her and you just go on. Well, that's not true because from there, then she had all these other things that nobody could tell me what to do about, right. You know, only wear purple, only wear certain fabrics. Nobody can touch her. Nobody can hold her, but mom, you know, they missed a, no, totally missed her. And then my, that would have been 2001, two, three ish. And then in 2003, my middle daughter was born. And um, so she was very quiet at first. So I thought, oh, she's the quiet baby. Now, granted, I've been around children my whole life. I had a daycare before my girls were were born oh, because I was okay. going to school and I had a daycare. So I've been around kids. I helped raise my brothers because I'm the oldest. So, you know, you think you know a little bit about children. <laughs> Whoa, did I not know? I know nothing, right? So uh, Lily was born and, you know, she was very quiet and I thought, oh, she's just going to be quiet. And she, she didn't crawl. She was a late crawler and a late walker, like 14 months, but she rolled. Like, I remember coming in the room one day and oh, like, how where's my child? She rolled around in the kitchen, you know, she was getting some place. <laughs> she absolutely <laughs> was. So uh, my oldest did everything early, talked early. She jumped before she could do anything. I mean, like it was, she went from crawl, sitting to crawling, to standing, to running and jumping, you know? Okay. So she could, you know, in 18 months, we were seeing the 12 days of Christmas. And so I never, ever thought there was anything because I didn't know anything yeah. about this stuff. I knew very, very little. So then Lily comes around. She's a non She really ended up being nonverbal. So about eight, um, she was two and a half and T I S or early in, in rainbow, early intervention came through the preschool. They did testing on all the children. And because Lily was already doing some really, some smart things, some things that I thought were ahead of her age. 
Um, I said, sure, go ahead and test her. I'd like to kind of see where she's at, but she wasn't talking yet. Really. This is you know, granted. She's yeah. two and a half, right? She was talking. She was babbling a lot, but I thought, oh, we just thought, so she was very obsessed with costumes and wearing fairy costumes and her language sounded like a fairy. So we thought, oh, it's so oh. cute. Right. Yeah. We had no idea. We videotaped it. It's so cute. I'm thinking show up, grow it. This is just the thing we'll remember her for, you know, or by in her life. And so when they tested her, they're like, well, you know, she's talking at an 18 month old level and she's almost three. I was like, what? Well, so like, this is a problem, you know, I mean, yeah. seriously, you don't so, know, um, you really no, don't you know. don't know. You don't know. And she did this cluttering stuff. She would go, okay, mommy. And I was like, sure. I hope I didn't tell her to run and it's okay to run out in the traffic, you know, oh, okay. stick her yep. finger in the socket, you know, cause you're like, what is she asking me? Yep. So that started us on our journey. So it was about six weeks before she turned three. They did all this testing on her. She's developmentally delayed. She's got NOS, which is non other specified because they couldn't figure it out. Yep. She was uh, language delayed and somewhat nonverbal. Um, she would do these things where like you'd say something to her and there'd be a glitch for a minute and then she might answer you but they couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. But it was like, it was like watching a computer that couldn't take input and yeah. then give output. Um, so she went into the state program. So it was through the school system and um, that's where my journey began. And, and I went in green as the grass thinking <laughs> that everyone like new baby grass, right. Thinking that everyone was looking out for my child. Everyone was on my side. Everyone had her best interest at heart. Now, there are people who do, but yeah. you as the parent have to educate yourself. It is the, when you find out that diagnosis and you get over that shock or that crying and that sadness of there's something wrong with my child. Cause that's the way the world sees it. Okay. Yeah. Just know that's the way the world sees it. It doesn't mean there's something wrong. It just means there's a challenge or, um, if deficit, if you want to call it, I don't even like to use that word. So I just say yeah. challenge a weakness that needs to be overcome and made into a strength for a child. Yeah. So when you get over that part and the fastest way to get through it is to educate, 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 look it up, yeah. read everything you can go to the S expert, find an expert, find somebody that, you know, that read the book you, I wrote, you trust, read the book <laughs> that Randy wrote. Yes. Because <laughs> that is the most empowering thing you can do because what it does is help you be a better parent. It helps you feel more empowered to help your child. And those, those ingredients are going to make the difference between the success your child has or doesn't have. If you ignore the things that are happening to your child and think they might outgrow them, there are some things kids outgrow, but the majority of things need early intervention. I mean, oh my gosh, I am such a huge, huge, huge advocate for early intervention in children because I've used it with two of my three kids and I've seen the em enormous strides that my kids have made. I, I actually considered years ago when Carson was little going into working at that age with them at 18 months, two, oh. three, four, and to, to help them get through because watching that magic happen of the intervention and the therapies working for a child that, okay, now this child can use scissors and actually cut, or yeah. they can hold a pencil and write, or they can actually talk now yeah. is I'm telling you, it's one of the most amazing, gratifying things to ever mm -hmm. witness in a child, especially when you have a child who like Lily didn't say, I love you to me until she was four or a little older. Yeah. And she was able to test. We were just talking about this last night at dinner. Actually, she was able to test out of uh, speech in third grade. She no oh, longer cool. requires their services. Yeah. Which is wonderful. Carson is in third grade. He still has OT and speech speech twice a week. OT is twice a week. So I, it's going to be a while before he, you know, yeah. and I don't know, we were talking about it last night. I wonder if he'll always have some form of help. I don't know. But what I do know is becoming, as soon as we get pregnant, Right, Randy, we become advocates for our children, our yeah, baby. For sure. We have to eat right. We have to be very careful the things we touch, you know, don't touch the cat litter, don't touch the lint in the dryer, you know, all those things you have to be really careful of, right? So, uh, just because you brought up cat litter, that was my favorite part of being pregnant is somebody else had to clean my cat litter. Oh, 
It's so my, stinky. My mom would actually come over to do it so that I didn't have to do it. Nice. Thank you, mom. If she's watching. Yeah, right. Yeah, because now I do it myself. It's almost like, oh, I wish I was pregnant again, but not actually. Plus, I physically can't be. But <laughs> right. <laughs> but I like, oh, the cat litter. Um, yeah. So a couple of things that I wanted to point out before we, we continue on is you don't know, right? Like you were talking about, you just thought that that was a cute little quirk that your daughter had, right? Yeah. And same with when I had my son, like when people would say, like after we were trying to get the diagnosis, people would say, oh, when did he start whatever, holding a spoon? When did he start talking in two word sentences? When did whatever, right? Whatever the question was. And I'm like giving them the answers, thinking nothing, like, no big deal about it because I didn't know. Like this was my first child that I had as a baby. Like, like my my older daughter is my my stepdaughter, and so I wasn't there when she was a newborn. I was there when she was three. So Mm -hmm. all of those anything happened before three. I had nothing to really compare it to. Yeah, I had a nephew and my little sisters were a decade younger than me, so I sort of remember when they were little. But really, I had nothing to compare it to, and I had no idea that these were delayed things or these were not regular normal those, it's amazing for those not watching quotations <laughs> right but it's amazing what you don't realize and when you get into this as a parent everything is taken very seriously the way they walk up the stairs the way they walk down the stairs regularly we would never pay attention to this stuff we would never pay attention to, okay, so my son never crawled normal. We, he had like a little spider monkey crawl. He dragged his leg. <gasps> my grandson does like, well, oh. he walks now, but he does this like spider man thing where he never wanted to put his knees on the ground, feet and hands only. Right. Okay. So let me, let me touch on something about that. Look into integrative, wait, reflex integrative therapy. So what, that's something we're using on Carson, his very first OT therapist is still a friend of mine. I just love her to pieces. And she mess. we talked in the summertime. She's like, Oh my gosh, I just, I got trained on this new therapy. It's amazing. I used it on my son for the last year. And I thought of you guys. So Carson, I took the test. Cause you know, we always have to answer questions for oh, our I kids and they have challenges and they have extra special needs. So we have to answer all those questions. And I, I did, he qualified with almost everything on the list. And so what this therapy does, uh, they're really exercises and they're super, super simple, but what it does is go back and whatever reflex was not integrated at birth on a timeline that is according to the growth charts of children, this will help it to go back and integrate and open those pathways in the brain. So the brain can do what it's supposed to do. So it's very interesting. So like, uh, if you, I I think I'm trying to think, what did she do to him last time she was here? Like she touched him somewhere, his back or his cheek. And he, you know, you know, when a baby, you know, when we do this to a baby and their mouth comes toward your, because they they think it's a pacifier or a bottle, you know, or a nipple for nursing. So he still does that. So that in that reflex never integrated appropriately. So there's an exercise that we're doing for that. There's also this, like, it's called a robot. It's, I can't even show you right now on camera, but it, it's quite, it's, it's, it takes coordination to do it. And you can, you know, it's easy to teach a child, but that one particularly um, focuses on um, reading and writing that connection in the brain. So I'm interested for him to continue to see what it does for him for reading and writing because being him being language delayed as well. Um, those are challenges for him because he has a language delay. So that whole processing, you know, is, you know, I mean the first day of kindergarten, they, I mean, and I'm not joking. They ran out to my car and said, we need to talk about some help for him. And he, listen, he, he's been in OT and speech since he was in swallowing early on since he was 18 months old. So, I mean, he's had help and still with him having help, they ran out to me the first day of kindergarten and said, okay, we got to work on his handwriting. Um, I need you to get this kind of pencil, you know, get oh, this wow. kind of paper, you That's know, we good need though that they were right on top of, oh it. yeah, totally on top of it the very first like, day for my kid. They were just like, nah, you're fine. Nah, fine. Uh, right? Until it became a major right. behavioral issue. Right. Then it was all of a sudden, oh, you need to go get tested and you need to do this. You need to do that. And like, it was, 
so I'll go back to the question I asked you and I'll give my answer. And, so, and then we'll both be on the same page here. So the question I asked, you know, when did you join the neurodiverse world? I have two answers to that. It's very funny. So my first answer is the day I was born. Um, I just there didn't know it till this year. <laughs> but when I knew that I had joined the world of it, my kid was eight. So at eight years old, finally got the diagnosis of autism. Now, it takes a lot longer for girls to get diagnosed. And let me clarify, because people have heard me say my son, trans. So born a girl is now a boy. So at the time um, we got the diagnosis, he, he was still a girl. And <coughs> when you look at a female for just what I've read and what I've researched, right? I'm not, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm just a mom. Um, but girls present autism very differently because we tend to mask better. And, you know, girls being more quiet is fine. Or, you know, we just, we try to fit in in different ways than boys <coughs> do. And so yeah. finally at eight years old, they were able to diagnose him. And it took a, such a long time because again, there was all that masking. Yeah, there was a speech delay. You could totally tell. Yes, there was fine motor skills. You could totally tell. But instead of looking at that route, they at first they diagnosed with ADHD and sensory integration and ODD and, and, and. They just listed a whole bunch of diagnoses. <coughs> wow. But all of them together really just made Said more autism. sense. Yeah, it just made more sense to just say autism because it incorporated all of these. <clears throat> So it was, right. and you were talking about how, you know, you have to get over that initial shock in yeah. our house. It was more of or a grief, shock or grief or whatever it is that you yeah. experience or well, denial. Okay. Even a lot of people for us, it was relief actually. Yes. Because it was such a long journey because it was all the way till at eight years old. And at that point being sent home for being suspended, actually having hospital trips because the meltdowns got so severe so for mm. us it was actually a relief like oh there's a reason why this is happening right well there's there is a yeah. there's like a it's like a person who is sick who keeps going to the doctor and they don't find anything until they do that mri and then oh that's what it is and, and i tell people who are so afraid of a diagnosis with a child listen if you go to the doctor and you don't get diagnosed you can't get the right medicine to get yeah. you better and it's the same exact thing with a child yeah. or an adult even right if you you know you don't have to carry that label forever if that is an issue for you but if it makes the difference between you being successful in life, understanding yourself better, accepting yourself better, accepting the world better, acclimating yourself to the world more. I mean, my gosh, why wouldn't you do it? I mean, yep. my husband had that, you know, when, the, when both Carson and Lily were little and he was like, you know, he didn't want them to have this label until I explained it to him, you know, I, and I guess being an advocate, I'm like so far past that, that what, what matters to me is having that correct diagnosis. Like you said, so you have relief. Oh yeah. gosh. Okay. That explains why that's going on. Exactly. Now. And, and, I and now how I you brought up work. like, yeah, how you just brought up, like, even as an adult, because, you know, 30 -ish years ago, <laughs> people didn't, it wasn't something that was talked about as much or diagnosed as much and people didn't I don't know the best way to say this so I'm just gonna say it however it comes up people didn't um give you the help that you required so at the time and you were talking about oh yeah we'll just tell stories about Lily when she was little and it's all just cute little quirk well for the past 10 years as an adult I had to hear my mom and my godmother tell all these stories about oh well when Randy was little and we were at this McDonald's and she had this big freak out and talking about all these different things that I did kind of teasing me it all now makes sense because now I finally had the assessment to say okay yes you do have autism and I'm like thank you I told you I wasn't just being a little brat. <laughs> a little well, brat. Because, yeah. right and so that's that's the other thing that's kind of a uh, how do we want to it's a misunderstanding that happens when people because it, ha it happens with me with Carson like neighbors my daughter's boyfriend, right? They, they look and they, they think it looks like he's being a brat or a spoiled child, but right. what it really is, is, is the 
inability to process what's happening and it's an overstimulation of the situation or being tired or being hungry. And so where you and I could, or, or any adult could maybe acclimate to that and go, you know, I'm tired and um, I, or I just need to go to the bathroom and, you know, I have to wait till the next stop, you know, yeah. on the interstate, right. For, for a child or a person with sensory issues, uh, it's like, oh, heck you got to do it now, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and so I was trying to explain to, um, who was I talking to this? I was talking to somebody this morning about um, sensory and how the input for someone like my son has to be much stronger than for me. So he's one of those that likes to run. We've used some behavioral therapy with this, but likes to run and throw himself on the ground or throw himself at the furniture or he's used yeah. me, you know? And so you have to supply things that will help. And we've had an indoor ch- jumping trampoline, a, you know, one of those small yep. indoor ones. Well, I've had one of those since he was 18 months old, because I was like, we cannot use the furniture and go to the ER. So you've yep. got to jump on something smaller yep. that's less to the ground that you're not going to get hurt, you know? So it's so funny when I go into somebody's house and they have an indoor tramp, I'm like, okay, got it. So, yep. you know, even if they've never had their kid diagnosed, I'm like, yep, got it. I yep. know, with, you know, so, um, it, it's really, we only do a disservice to our child and we fail them as a parent or a caregiver when we do not keep searching for them, especially if you have that instinct, because you do get, like you brought up, Randy, you do get, oh, your child's fine. You yeah. know, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. They'll outgrow it. Well, if and you brought up, you brought up the word spoiled. That's what everybody used to tell my mom. They, everybody, oh. my aunt used to tell her and it was like, oh, you just spoil her or you just spoil her. Mm. And I never even felt like a spoiled child. Like looking back, I never got every little thing that I wanted. I got told no lots of times. Right. <laughs> like, I wasn't a spoiled child, but that's what people would tell my mom. But that wasn't the issue. We just right. The issue was that it was just too much. The input yeah. that you were receiving is too much. And I'll tell you something interesting. Oh, well, Carson has already decided at eight that he does not like the word no. He does not like anyone to say no to him. And it makes him very mad. So we've had to have lots of conversations about this because I'm like, you are not going to be one of those teenagers that is, you know, got the oppositional defiant going on and yeah. you, you know, you're throwing things and you're 15 and no, 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 no. So everyone has to hear no and no teaches us boundaries. It teaches us responsibility. It teaches us respect and it teaches us what we can and cannot do. And sometimes we have to earn those things that we want. So trying to have those very adult conversations with a child is very challenging. So when, um, Carson was a baby, um, now he totally changed after his, he was two years old, taking his 18 month old vaccines. And he already had signs of stuff that it, it exacerbated everything for him. He became a totally different child. And this is not based on anything. This is based on the experience we had. You can watch video and you can see the difference in my son. So there began, began a year of screaming, literally screaming so loud over certain things. We, we quit going places and he was one of those children that if he's in the stroller and and it didn't happen so much in the grocery cart, but in the stroller, if you walked up to him full on blood curling screaming, where people would just go like, Oh, and and if, if a friend of mine was walking up, I would go stay there. Don't come any closer. Okay. And you know, it's hard because as a mom or a dad or whoever the caregiver is, you got to explain this to people, Yeah. but we also have to detach ourselves enough from it that it doesn't become personal and make us cry, make us just feel worn out about it. And and just you affect your self-esteem as a parent. You know what I mean? That's what I was going to say. I'm embarrassed. So, um, now I don't, I can't say for certain because I'm not my mom, but from the way that she would say stuff to me and whatever, it was like, she was embarrassed. Is that my, my, cause she would always say, okay, so we're just going to be here. And she would use this tone of voice. We're just going to be here for like 30 minutes. So just be nice. And in my head, I'm thinking I'm nice. Like I'm not a not nice, person. like I'm nice. It's just not my fault that you want me to hug these people that I don't know. It's not my fault that you want me to play with these kids. I don't know. Like you're putting me in a very uncomfortable situation. And then you're going to say that I'm embarrassing you. Mm, No, you are putting me in an uncomfortable situation. Right. So that's a very important thing, Randy. And I hope you teach about that because people don't, we, 
how do we say this? We expect children to just acclimate and be okay with a certain situation because they just need to get over it. Right. You just put your big girl panties on your big boy panties on whatever it is you wear yeah. and get over it. Suck it up buttercup, yep. you know, yep. and that is an old mentality. I mean, our grandparents had that our parents did great grandparents did, yeah. you know, uh, back, you know, kids are to be seen, not heard. Exactly. You know, all, all of that just does not work. So what I will say for, um, like that situation with Carson, with people walking up to him and him screaming, when you have a child that's so sensitive, okay, we we all have energy, right? We're all yeah. made of energy. So he could already sense a person. It, it's like a, an empath on steroids. Never thought about that before, but that's what we're <laughs> but call, yeah, right? it pretty much is. Yeah. Because it's almost like if you touched me and I got a lot of sensory input from you and it was overwhelming yeah. because you're an adult and I'm this little two-year-old. Okay. So what am I going to do? I'm going to scream because when you touch me, it's too loud or too much or hurts too much. And I can't put a word to it. I have no idea what's going on. I don't understand exactly. what's happening. So isn't that interesting? Yep. And so when my, my kid was younger, I mean, even now sometimes, but he's 15 now, so it's not as big of a deal. And he's learned a lot about himself and on the right medication with words, which really helps and things. But we never, we never said you had to hug an aunt or an uncle or a cousin or whatever. That is your That's choice. Okay. Um, and we never, like, sometimes we'd go to an event and like a birthday party or something. And we'd end up leaving early because that's how long that he could last there. And that's, that's how long. Now, there's definitely times that we tried to coax him into staying longer, you know, but we always gave an option of taking a break too. It was always, you know what, why don't we go in the other room? We'll just take a break. Because sometimes yeah. that's all it was needed, right? Is just take a little break and in 15, right. 20 minutes, come back and join everyone else. Right. So there, there's, there are options. And I think that's something that you have to learn as you go, because not everything is going to work for every child. Right. Right. And not every child, some children will get over that shy. You can call it shyness. They can yeah. get over that. And some children cannot. And sometimes there's that, that thinking, that mindset of pushing them out into it will help them to overcome it. It's like desensitizing, right? And no, it never works for me, <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody. I mean, my 21 year old still had times when she is Feeling a lot is what she said. That's how we call it. She's oh, in the like fields. That. She'll text me, go, mom, I'm in the fields right now. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so then we have these conversations through texting or the phone or whatever, but she still at 21 has times where she does not want to be hugged or touched. Yeah. And so her life growing up and her not being diagnosed with whatever it is, sensory and, and you know, input and other things Yeah. that was hard for me. Cause I am a hugger, but I am also somebody who some, I don't want you touching me sometimes, you know, I, I yeah. don't want to hug from you, you know, cause it, it just feels yucky or whatever you want to call it. So, you know, it, what I find also very interesting, I don't know if we talked about this last time or not, that the, that being an empath, a highly intuitive, highly sensitive human being is very, very much like a sensory person on the spectrum. I think we did mention that. Yeah. They told, they completely intertwine. That yeah. has been my experience and it's been something I've been watching for years now. Yeah. And so I find it extremely fascinating. I've not ever gone to a doctor or scientist to, Hey, you know, I want to, I want to research this. I'm just taking bits and pieces of it along the way, keeping my notes yeah. myself and making those evaluations and, and, and observations. But, um, I find it really fascinating how it all seems to kind of go together because what I find, especially my three children are, uh, all of them are, have sensory, all of them are very, um, very intuitive, uh, very empathic, I pick up on stuff a lot. Um, you know, Carson said to me, gosh, about a month ago, he looked over at me, he was trying to go to sleep. He said, mommy, I'm so worried about you and your headache tomorrow. And I said, oh. what? I said, what are you talking about, baby? He said, I'm just worried, mommy. And I said, oh, mommy's fine. Yeah. I, woke up, I woke up the next day sick. Oh. With a just horrendous, you know, sinus 
down for the count, kind of head and I thought, wow, oh, my word. Okay. So now he's tuning into <laughs> he's feminine. Wow. He, he, you know what I mean? so, so these little guys, their, their brains are so amazing and so fascinating what they're tuned into. And so much, so many times they can't talk about it. Like, yeah. you know, all these teenagers that are suffering from depression and anxiety, a lot of them are suffering for what somebody else is experiencing because they are open and they're picking it up. You know, that, yeah. that energy, they're feeling it. It's like, you know, how you walk in a room and it's like, Oh, feels kind of yucky in here, you know, because maybe somebody was fighting or somebody's had a bad day yeah. or he's very sad. I don't know about you, but I, I do pick up on that, that kind of stuff. I, I sense it when I walk into a room of people. And, um, so, you know, if we could teach our teenagers and young children and, you know, any kids or whatever, how to really understand and feel what they're feeling, because they could be happy one minute and then they sit down next to their friend, Joe, and then all of a sudden they're sad and depressed and they don't know why they can't even explain yeah. it. They're carrying it around. And it's yeah. like, well, you know, it may not be what you, what you're really feeling. You may just be picking up on your friend because you care about your friend you know, you want to make sure they're happy and feeling good. You have sympathy for them. Yeah. So it's really, really fine. It's an interesting thing to learn and teach about and to understand. Yeah. So what is one thing that you have learned along the way that you wish you would have known at the beginning? Um, how to follow my gut instinct, my intuition as a mother. That's a good one. Um, yeah. I would say, yeah, see, I can't follow that up. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, share, just share it with me because it is so I'm, I'm going to say, take notes right away. Yeah. Because especially like I have such a horrible memory and I mean, maybe other people's memories aren't quite as horrible as mine, but when the doctors are asking questions later, and I mean, we saw so many doctors and most people probably have where they're asking the same questions. I'm like, am I giving the same answer? I don't even remember what I said. And you're, you're well, in such a state of like emotional disruption right. that it, it's hard. So you could also have post baby brain, you know, you have postpartum depression or post baby brain or whatever. So everything's kind of a fog. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I've had to do the same thing with both, both of two of my kids. I've had to go back, you know, even now he's eight and they'll ask me, so when did he first do this? And when did, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to go look in my file, you know, cause I have no clue. I can't remember exactly yeah. when he did this. Cause I, maybe I haven't filled out a form like that in a year or two, you know, yeah, and exactly. that specific. yeah. Exactly. So I think that's great. You know, take notes and anything that you see that your child does that you think is, Ah, uh, what's a word we can use as positive? Um, because odd is not a quirky. positive word, and quirky is a cute word, and um, <laughs> everybody has quirks. So I guess that anything that you think you you kind of have a reaction that goes, hmm, you know, take note of that. I mean, when before Carson was ever diagnosed, and he was like still doing the spider crawl, yeah, you know, he would he would spin his spoons. And then he would, he would put some of them on the floor and then he'd take his head all the way down and so he could watch it. And oh. I was like, at first I was like, that's really fascinating that he, his little brain does that. That's yeah. fascinating. Then I learned, <laughs> then through the years realized, you know, he takes a lot of his stuff by his eyes, you know, cause that's, that's a way for sensory input into the body, you know? My middle daughter was one who licked everything. So I remember going into like Cracker Barrel and, and I McDonald's and even um, Chick-fil-A. Could you please put your sinks higher for children like mine? You know, I was like so fed up because yeah. the little things are right there at their mouths. The door locks to the bathrooms are right there at their mouths, you know? And if you've got an orally fixated kid, yeah. I mean, you're in trouble because yeah. they're going to lick everything. We both, both my kid and my and myself, we like to just touch stuff. Like, we're just mm -hmm. like, oh, this is so soft. And this yeah. is like, especially soft stuff. It was yeah. funny actually when me and my husband were just at the flooring store on the weekend. And not that we were getting carpet, but I was drawn to the carpet section. And I had to touch like every single one. 
And then every time one was soft, I had like, I told my, oh, this one's so soft. Oh, this one's so soft. My husband was like, yes, honey, they're carpets. They're, they're soft. Like, yeah, but it's sensory. It's input you're taking in. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's the way that you feel the world. And, and like uh, what my kids do is, oh, it's so aesthetically pleasing mother. I mean, these are the words that my kids use, right? Yep. You know, it's so pleasing to the eyes. And oh, I just like, that's how, that's the language that we use yep. in this house. You know, so we do have a lot of sensory stuff and a lot of touchy feely things. And, you know, like um, cracking the eggs and Carson, I want to stick, can I stick my finger in the yolk? Absolutely. Try it. See how it yeah. feels. Right. Yeah. Cause it's, very innocent. And, and it gives that input that they're looking for. And, um, you know, sometimes we can take input by, if you're, if you're an empathic person, you can feel what that input might be. Watch just yeah. watching somebody do it. Like when you're watching a movie and somebody portrays across the camera to you, yeah. a sadness or a happiness or excitement, you can feel that with that person. Yeah. So you've gotten that, you've gotten that feedback that, it, that, uh, that input, but sometimes we actually physically need to touch or yeah. step on or, you know, sit on or lay on or smell. Carson's a sniffer. He likes to smell everything. Uh, you know? No, I'm a toucher. I like touch, touch, touch. touch. So you have which a why, lot of... Which is why I'm constantly playing with my hair or, oh, I, have okay. a, or I have a skinny ring. And oh, just, yes. That's my, that's my jam. I just like to touch. That's your, that's it. your fidget. That's your yeah. fidget. Yeah. yeah. Love it. I used to chew gum. I used to chew gum. Like... I chew a lot of gum. Oh, um, because if I don't, I, I play with my teeth. Like I sometimes I'll grind them, but it's not so much a grinding as it feels very cool. Again, it's a sensory thing. So as yeah. I'm, as I'm chewing them or like just moving them around, it feels cool. So in order to stop that, cause it's actually not very good for my teeth. Cause right. I just, I told me lots of times not to do it. Um, right. is what I do. And that way I'm not grinding my teeth together. Right. Well, my oldest used to do this in class like this. And then she'd get in trouble with the teacher. The teacher would get mad. And I was like, she's just touching her hair. Yeah. It's, a, it's a calming thing for her, you know? Yeah. So I, I know, um, that it, it when I mean, I'm trying to think of when I stopped chewing gum. Cause that was like a, it used to help me. It used to calm me down. It was like an, you know, it would help that external, yeah. like the fidget does, you know? Um, but I, I, you know, when we come into this world and the baby comes out and it's screaming, right. For survival. Cause that's what a baby mm -hmm. knows. And we stick uh, something in its mouth to calm it down. Yeah. And then it finds comfort and soothing for that. Then at some point the world makes that wrong. It's true. And it's so true. think about this. If, if you're doing that from your first breath of life and it's ingrained in you, how are we supposed to think that people can conquer that in, to know, to detach from it, to know, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. I have never or, thought of it that way, but you're I mean, right. And like my mama, whenever I was little, I'd be like, oh, I'm hungry. She'd always be like, ah, you were born hungry. I had to put a pacifier in your mouth right away. I'm like, yeah. yeah, you do. So we, so, so it's like, it's almost like on us for trying to correct something that's ingrained from birth as a survival technique. So yeah. you have people who are nervous in the world and what do they do? They smoke, right? Because when they smoke, it calms them down, even though yeah. it's a really bad thing because it's a lot of toxins, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have people who drink, it calms everything down. You have people who I used to chew straws, you know, oh. chew on the straw, right? I don't know why. Now I've got one of my daughters that does it. I don't do it anymore. So maybe it's a gene thing, a genetic thing. You know, you, it's funny how you, you see your kids do things that you did and you're like, I never taught them how to do that. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. so it's pretty funny. Right. But I mean, we think about that. And so how can we replace oral fixations in the, in life? Because food is sustenance, right? Food goes in the mouth. We yeah. have to have it to live and survive. We have to drink to live and survive. So it's kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? It is. And I had never, never thought about that before, but I like that. And it's becoming a little a little bit more commonplace for people to, to accept chewing stuff or putting stuff in your mouth. Um, because there is like the, the true jewelry, there we go. Yep, the jewelry. Chewy yep. jewelry yep. Um, yep. but there are still, you know, a lot of people that would look at that and go, what the heck are you doing? Well, it's better that than they're, you know, chewing their fingernails down to the nub. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So 
for the last question before we wrap up, I just want to mm -hmm. ask, you know, what advice would you give to a parent? Because really this episode is kind of geared towards parents a little bit more. Um, what, what advice would you give to a parent who's struggling, but they're just not quite sure? Or actually, you know what? Anybody. Yes, parents, but anybody. If you're struggling and you're just not quite sure, what's your advice? Okay, so what you're not quite sure about what? About what what's going on? Like you're you're seeing maybe you're seeing some stuff. issues. You're you're seeing stuff and you're just you're just not quite sure. Well, I think they that we need to give them both of our advice to take notes, keep a log, you know, um, because a child who even reacts to food, you're going to need to keep a journal to see what do they react to, you know, what sets them off. Okay. If certain foods make them crazy, like my oldest couldn't have green jello, she'd bounce off the walls, right? Really, so, I've heard a lot with red, but not green. I know we used to laugh when she was little, like she would like, she's four or five. She go, I can't eat green jello. Cause it makes me crazy. And we'd laugh about it. Right. But you know, but no, she was not allowed to have green jello. So, um, I would say you need to take notes and you need to follow what your instinct is. If your instinct says, you know, there's something that needs to be checked or investigated further or looked into, you know, don't stop until you find the doctor or you find a professional who will listen to you and not just blow you off. Don't ever discount your instinct because for, to me, I always call it the God alarm that was given to us at birth. It's that alarm inside of us that tells us it's that instinct that tells us to follow something or to go to the right instead of the left or to go straight or, you know, jump over this or stay away from that person or go towards this person, you know, and, and it's, it's with us. So we need to honor that and listen to it, that, and taking notes and keep, you know, going, ask, ask around, you know, if you're go into a community on Facebook and ask to join a, a Facebook group that, that has to do with yes. that and ask, ask the questions in there, because those parents are usually always they're always very serious and honest. If you ask a question, they're always willing to help. I have found that in yeah. any group I've ever been in, just so helpful and, you know, very knowledgeable. A lot of these parents, they've been on a long road. You have been on a long road. I have been on a long road. We've done a lot of research. We've done a lot of studying. We've had a lot of hours dealing with situations. We've had a lot of cries. We've had a lot of lows. We've had a lot of highs. We've had some days that feel successful you know, but you can feel so alone on this journey. So you've got to reach out to others who are dealing with the same thing and go into one of those groups and ask somebody, what pediatrician do you go to? What neurologist do you go to? Cause my kid is showing things that I'm concerned about. And the pediatrician's blowing me off yeah. or the school is blowing me off. So can you help me? Cause somebody will help you. Yeah. Oh, I love all of that. That's such great advice. I have uh, some follow-up advice, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Um, so mine good. is for, and this is why I changed the question to not just include parents, but to include everyone, is that if you've always wondered about it for yourself, go talk to a doctor and figure it out. Like, because it can make a big, like, ah, oh, things make sense. And once they make more sense, then it's easier to kind of embrace who you are and who you are instead of trying to always hide it and change it so <clears> well are thinking something is wrong with you you know because that affects your self-esteem and how you present yourself in the world exactly. so and you know you yeah so it helps you to accept who you are and then you can then you if people if you're a person who feels like you have to make an excuse for others you know because you want to fit in or you want other people to like you because everyone wants to feel heard and liked I don't care yeah. who you are you know oh, yeah um but you won't, there's no reason to say, be sorry for, you know, oh, I'm sorry. I do that. Or, you know, whatever. Yeah, no. no, no. I mean, you know, yeah. you are who you are and you're going to end up migrating or, you know, being in a troop, a tribe, a group or whatever that is like-minded. Exactly. You will find that, you know, and if you haven't found it, then keep looking for it because yeah. it, it'll be there. And actually my second point goes along perfectly with that, which is as, as a parent of a kid that has autism, I lost friends along mm. the way because they couldn't understand why we wouldn't go to certain events or why we would leave early or whatever. Yeah. You know what? They weren't really good friends then. And so that is my, my last kind of piece of advice is you will 
you know, expect to lose some people in your life, but yep. you're not losing people who actually matter because the people who matter will stay by you and you will meet some amazing people by finally knowing who you are, knowing who your kid is and embracing that part of it. So when you join these communities, like I have gained most of my friends from joining those communities and, and reaching out to other people. So that's, that's what I've got. That's very important. It's very important because, um, there are things that you can't go do, you know, there are things that you have to kind of, Oh, you have to cushion it. You have to do it different. You have to bring, I mean, you know, when my guy was little, every volleyball game for his sister had to have his headphones on. And so, um, another really big thing that bothered me so much, actually, when my kid was younger now, like I said, at 15, he's a lot more independent. I, it's not a big deal anymore to leave him by himself for a little bit when, but when he was younger and it was like, okay, we, we need a babysitter, you know, and at the time I was working out of the house or at least trying to work out of the house and people would say, Oh, you guys, you need a, a date night at least once a month. That, that's going to help relieve your stress. And I'm like, cool. Do you have a babysitter that understands autism and understands my child when they have a freak out? Yeah. Well, um, no. Yeah. Me neither. We've tried to find babysitters. We cannot find a suitable babysitter for our yeah, it's hard. child. Right. I, I and, know. And so it would bug me when people were like, oh, you just need a date night or somebody else said, oh, just go to the local high school and find a babysitter there. And yeah, for a neurotypical child, that would probably be a very valid and reasonable option. Right. But it wasn't an option that we had available to us because, I mean, I struggled to deal with my kid at times. And I'm going to ask this teenager to do it. Absolutely not. That's not fair to them. Right. You need somebody who's trained. And I mean, like you said, like even you have, yeah, I, I, I was years ago and I left my little guy home with my oldest and she's his sister. Right. Yep. And she called me with an SOS. Oh my gosh, mom, he's freaking out. I don't know what to do. I need you to come home right now. Cause I can't handle this. Right. Yeah. So the, that happens and it's hard because there's, you know, I have friends with children who are, are there, they need so much care. And so they don't get to have those breaks in life, you know? And, and so if you are a person who is thinking about taking care of or helping, or you're a neighbor who could help somebody with a child who has needs and challenges, you know, give that person a rest, you know, even, even if they don't leave the house, if you're just there to watch the kids so they can take a nap or get laundry done, prep, food for the week. That's a huge help even because huge. it is hard to get those regular things done when you have to yeah. have your eyes constantly on your child. Right. And I mean, right. parents of newborns know that <laughs> just yeah. like you nap when the baby naps. Right. So, right. It, it, yeah. You don't try to get all this other stuff done. And it, you, you know, when, Car when my guy was little, I used to say to sisters, okay, it's dinner time. You want to cook dinner or you want to entertain your brother and take care of him? Well, okay, we'll take care of him, you know, because they don't want to cook. So, exactly. and then, so cooking became my refuge. I mean, it still yeah. is, even though I need my kids cooking so they understand and learn and grow that yeah. way. But really, dinner cooking that was my refuge. It was like nobody's in the kitchen with me. I could totally tune out, watch everything, cook it on the stove, and I can yeah. decompress for that however long it takes me to cook. Exactly. So, yeah. even if you, you don't feel comfortable watching the child by yourself, I mean, Instead of saying, hey, do you want to go out and meet for coffee? Bring the coffee to them too. Like there's absolutely there's ways that you can support them where yes. everyone can feel comfortable and no one has to be put into a situation where they're unsure or they're uncomfortable. Yep. Absolutely. Yes. So um, one more time, tell everybody where they can get your books. Because I know we weren't really talking about you because this is our follow-up episode, but if people like yeah. what they heard this time and they haven't heard your last episode, which is episode 67, so go back and listen to it. <laughs> That's the oh, year no. I was born. Ooh, right. Yay. Um, yes. So tell everybody where they can get your book. Okay. Yeah. You can go to www.maryejackson.com. I'm also on Amazon. Um, you can also find my books at Tuscany Bay Books as well. Um, if you go to my website, um, oh. you'll see... 
you'll see all my books there. You'll also see a link to the videos for like the writer's corner live TV show that I do. It's for authors and then also special needs TV. So that there's a link for both of those. And, um, there's some stuff on there, like little videos for parents, you know, first time diagnosis and things like that. And actually I just wrote up some things for like mental health. And then I've got to get them up on my website for PDFs for people to download that they can use to pro do some processing and kind of help them get from like maybe conquer something or break through something or, you know, just help them get back to maybe a greener, happier state of, uh, you know, feeling and thoughts and being period. So That's I, I'm awesome. going to be getting those up this week. So I'm excited about it. Yay. That is good. And where can people follow you? Um, well, you can follow me on Facebook. My name, Mary Elizabeth Jackson. I am on Twitter at Mary underscore E underscore Jackson. I am on Instagram at Mary Jackson five, because there's five of us. And on LinkedIn with my name, Mary E. Jackson. I am on Clubhouse under Mary E. Jackson. Um, and I just joined Wisdom my same name. So everywhere, you know, my name, I, it's, it's very consistent. So that that's, so you can follow me that way. Wonderful. Um, and I wasn't going to, but this just popped into my head. So because we're talking about this topic specifically, and I don't normally, um, promote my own books on these episodes, but because we're talking about this specifically, I have just released two social stories books. They are on Amazon. So one is, and I've have my copies upstairs. I should have had them here to show. Um, but one is about just conversations and the need to take turns in a conversation. And the other one is about how to go to the bathroom and wash your hands afterwards. So oh, if, if you're, if you know any kids that are struggling with that, they are available on Amazon and they're just these tiny little books. I, I just, got, I literally just got my copies today <laughs> of Yay. them and they look so cute. They are perfect. Um, oh, I love them. I love them. I love them. Okay. So yeah, I need to, I want you to, um, will you do a post about them and tag me and I'll share it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I'd love to. Yes. Cause the, and then, and like, I've got tears from heaven. That's for middle graders. That's got yes. lots, of, it's got lots, of, lots of issues that kids are going through that are, that it covers with applications in the back of the book. So I'm asking organizations if they want to partner with me, I'm asking folks to buy the books and to donate them to churches or schools or foster care, you know, anywhere kids are, you know, reach out to me if you want to partner, because this is a really, um, all of this stuff is very important and kids need as much support and love as they can get right now and tools to help them process what they're going through and help them to self-regulate back to, feeling better, being in a better mental state. And I've got some, you know, some great organizations that are starting to partner with me and either support it or endorse it. You know, like I just got a message from quantum learning last night out in California, and that's the eight keys of excellence. And, um, it's amazing. You know, you need to look up the, it, it's a great organization and what they teach in schools is just fantastic. So I'm going to be partnering with her to write a book but about this, about the eight keys, but also, um, she's got the book in the newsletter. that's going out to all their families. So I'm so excited about that. But, that is awesome. So we have yeah. lots of awesome products for people. And I guess, um, I did mention early on the show by my book, um, that book is actually referring to the second book that I published called the mother's truth. And that is the parent's perspective. That's my journey, right? Very from pregnancy important. to grade six. And again, it's got some resources in the back, like, um, Mary was saying with her stuff, it has resources in the back. So you can pick that up on Amazon at the same time you're picking up the social stories. Feel That's like right. I'm doing a little so, infomercial. Yeah, there <laughs> we go. I know, right? So it's almost Christmas time. There's books that can be bought. There are good books that are teaching and helping. And, you know, the potty training book is very important because when you have a child with needs, it takes them. I actually just read an article about this. I mean, I already knew this, but I just, I sometimes articles will pop up and I'll read over yeah. them. And is there any new information, you know, out there? And so it does take a child who is on the spectrum or disabled to learn to learn to potty train. Uh, it, it, they don't potty train at the same time, a, you know, a typical child is going to potty train. And a lot of that has to do with their sensory and being able to sense that, that body and, you know, their brain and everything working together. And do I, you know, do I get the, in those signals to go to the bathroom? And I know for like my son, you know, going to the bathroom and wiping is a, a big issue for kids with sensory. They yes, don't want to touch. Struggled, any of it. We struggled with that so long. And 
wearing underwear under pants because it was like a layering issue. Yes. Yeah. So, so you know, those I, are things that a lot of people don't think about. No. And actually a great tip because you made me think of this and we're talking about potty training. Um, how we ended up potty training our son is back then um, he only wore dresses because that's, you know, back when he was still a girl and trying to be a girl. Um, and so like, I'm talking like two or three years old, only would wear dresses, only would wear dresses, tried, you know, the, oh, you went to the potty. Here's a, here's a sticker thing. Didn't work. So what we ended up doing is um, if he had an accident, then mm -hmm. he put on a pair of pants. And he didn't like that because he was told that girls wear dresses. Like this was what his um, older sister was saying to him, right? Uh -huh. And so, because she has a very black and white gender roles, whereas the rest of us are much more fluid. Um, and so that was actually how the easiest way to potty train him was, okay, well, okay. I'm sorry that you had an accident, but now you don't have another dress to wear. So I guess you have to wear these pants. And we didn't make it like a bad thing. Like, don't get me wrong. Right. It wasn't like, now you have to, it was like, oh no, now we have to do this because we have to wash your clothes first. Um, and it potty trained yeah. like that after that. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You got to find that's what good. works. Yeah. You got to find what works. So yeah. yeah. Um, anyways, I could go on and on forever, but we are going to end this episode. Thank you so much again, Mary, for coming back on and sharing a little bit more um, because again, this is such an important topic and I know we didn't specifically um, talk about mental health, but heck, it's my show and I want to talk about autism too. <laughs> well, yes. And you know, but this is, their mental health is rolled up in all oh, of this. It's, it's, so, the stress it's, from it is so there's a higher rate of divorce in families with children who have challenges of, of all varying degrees. It doesn't matter because raising kids is a challenge. And then you throw in everything else. Um, and it just kind of, you know, takes it up several notches. So mental health is very much a part of all of this. And, um, so, you know, keep going, keep trudging forward in your life, you know, and you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days, but just keep getting up and keep going. Right. Bye. Bye. So that was another excellent conversation that I had with Mary. Make sure you check out those links down below in the description. I'm also going to throw down in the description, the link to those social stories in case you're interested and you want to get all your hands on those and stay up to date that because I am going to be publishing more of those. I think the next one I've got almost done is the putting your toys away, which I still struggle with. Maybe I'm going to write it and give a copy to my husband and be like, look, this is how you put stuff away. Um, so again, thank you, Mary, for being on the show. And remember, the only way to end the stigma of mental health is to speak openly and honestly. Bye.